Yes. So before we move to 1989, just picking up upon the last matter I was uh, asking you about, I think for the sake of completeness, rather than necessarily because it gives rise to a question, um, I wanted to just put up on screen Tony Newton's announcement of the payment of the £10 million in Parliament. It's LDOW 00000241, please, Lawrence. We can see the date of the announcement is the 16th of November 1987, and we can see on the left-hand column it's being um, made by uh, Tony Newton. Um, uh, and if we just go a little further down that column, please, Lawrence. We can see um, penultimate paragraph on the screen, the grant of £10 million is being made from the reserve. So th there's the announcement. Can we just go back to the whole page, please? You'll then see, um, Sir John uh, and um, uh, Chair, bottom of the page, Robin Cook um, responds. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, if we go to the top of the next column, please, we can see the question being asked by Robin Cook was, will the minister explain how he has costed the fund and come up with £10 million? Or was it a convenient round figure? Is he aware that per head it represents just over £8,000 for every person infected and that that is less than half the capital sum that is paid by his department in cases of vaccine damage? Is he satisfied that such a modest sum is enough, particularly when the most pressing need for the families of the victims is to keep a roof over their heads by clearing a mortgage? Um, and, and then the next paragraph, uh, Robin Cook asks if, there'll be an, if the minister will undertake to review with the Haemophilia Society the size of the fund. And then Mr Newton's answer, if we just go a little further down the column, um, uh, he says in the second paragraph, on a number of occasions I've commented on the difficulty of a compensation scheme. This is not a compensation scheme, that must be made clear. It is a recognition of a special and unique combination of circumstances and I'm glad to make that recognition. On the matter of the £10 million, we arrived at a broad estimate of a sum that we felt would give significant help to the group affected, recognising that to calculate in terms of a specific sum per individual would not take account of the great differences between the circumstances of the individuals affected. Uh, th that is one reason why we've not attempted to have a regulated scheme. For example, some may be young single men, others may be older men with families and so on. On that basis, we've arrived at this sum and this flexibility of scheme. Uh, and then he says in the next paragraph, it'll be up to the society, and it was of course the McFarlane Trust, um, ultimately to decide how to administer the £10 million. Um, there's then a debate that continues um, with some expressing the view that the sum was less than um, adequate. Um, or rather Scrooge-like. Um, but that, that's the parliamentary debate in any event um, uh, for the sake of, sake of completeness. Um, so, John, I, I, if there's any comment you wish to make on that, please do. I don't have a specific question. I just wanted to draw attention to it to complete the, the issues we were looking at before the break. No, I, I don't honestly think at this distance in time there's any comment I can make that will add to what you've just said. So if we move then two years forward in time to the autumn of 1989, by which time uh, you had taken up the post of Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, if we can start with HMTR 601 underscore 005. Now, this is a minute from Mr. Saunders in the Treasury, dated the 13th of November 1989, and it is, as I understand your statement, addressed to your principal private secretary. Um, the heading is Autumn Statement, Haemophiliacs and AIDS, uh, and it says in the first paragraph, you asked for a line to take should the question be raised of compensation for haemophiliacs who contracted AIDS through treatment with infected blood products, the following is based on briefing which was supplied for Prime Minister's questions yesterday. And then the line to take is um, that it, essentially it's a matter for the Secretary of State for Health. Um, uh, there's reference then to the £10 million. The Department of Health has always made clear if representations were made that further contributions were necessary, it would be prepared to consider them. Um, and then if we just go over the page... Um, we can pick it up under the heading not for use, 
So this, I think, is for, you, for your background information rather than for public dissemination. Uh, paragraph 5 refers to um, consideration being given by Mr Clark, who was said to be sceptical about the need for any further payment. Mrs Bottomley is said to think that the government must be seen uh, to be doing more. Um, now, this is uh, um, the genesis of what became a further payment to the McFarlane Trust um, in late 1989. As I understand it, um, Sir John, um, you don't know if you saw this at the time, but you think you would have um, probably had some form of discussion with the Chief Secretary, who by then was Norman Lamont, about it. Is that right? Well, I don't know whether I would have had a discussion, as you put it, with it, but I think it's likely that Norman would have told me about the letter at our morning meeting. Um, during the period I was Chancellor, we would have morning meetings, and all the Treasury officials would be there, although they had quite distinctive responsibilities. They would report on what was happening. So I would be surprised if Norman hadn't told me about it, but I have no recollection of it, and, I, and there was no action for me to take on it. Um, and then... Um if we just follow um, things through with a couple of documents, um, again, still from November of 1989, CABO 0100003 005, please. Now, this is an internal number 10 document from Paul Gray to the Prime Minister, 17th of November 1989. Um, and it refers to um, a, a minute having been provided by Ken Clark, uh, proposing an, an early announcement of a further £20 million injection to the McFarlane Trust. He said, we know warning this was coming, there's no evidence it's been cleared with the Treasury. Um, I don't think I need to read through the rest of it. Um, bottom of the <coughs> page, however, last paragraph says, earlier in the week you did, of course, ask John Major to have a look at this, and we had sought to ensure that the Treasury and DH looked at this together. Um, as I say, it's not clear that this has yet happened. So the best approach might be for you to have an early chat with both Ken Clark and John Major before giving any reaction to the £20 million proposal. Um, and then we can see um, at HMTR 601 underscore 007, Um, this is 19th of November 1989. This records the Prime Minister uh, responding to, to the Secretary of State for Health's minute and saying she wants to discuss it with the Chancellor of the Exchequer and with the Secretary of State for Health. Now, as I understand your statement and the documents, it doesn't appear as though a further discussion directly involving you took place, but instead it was delegated to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Is that right? Well, I don't think it was delegated in quite that fashion. Uh, what happened... I think was that the Prime Minister was due to meet the Haemophilia Society and she had another meeting with the Chief Secretary. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, she had a meeting with the Chief Secretary that was fixed and I think she must have discussed it with the Chief Secretary, which was more appropriate than talking to me about it since it was by then his responsibility for uh, public expenditure. She might have minuted out she wanted to talk to Ken Clark as Secretary of State and me as Chancellor. But in fact, within the Treasury, it would have been Norman Lamont who would really have dealt with it. So I suspect when he was with her, they had that discussion and my meeting with her fell away and never took place. Um, th there are just a couple of further documents I want to uh, ask you about, although I think there's no direct <coughs> evidence of, of, of you contributing to, to this discussion, but you may be able to assist us in, in understanding what's being referred to. The first is HMTR 601 underscore 009. Um, now, this is a uh, minute from Mr. Saunders, 20th of November 1989. Um, so, it, again, it's a Treasury <coughs> minute to the Chief Secretary. We can see it's copied to you, CC Chancellor. Uh, and then we can see under the heading Haemophiliacs and AIDS, you're attending a meeting about this with the Prime Minister this afternoon, and then we have the reference to the uh, meeting the Prime Minister was having with the Haemophilia Society. Paragraph 3, um, the, the Treasury official says this, you should support Mr Clark's proposals, 
so long as he agrees to absorb the costs, as in paragraph 5 below, and join with him in resisting any pressure for more generous treatment. Um, and, and then further background is set out about previous payments and what was now being proposed. Um, and then if we go over the page um, under the heading discussion, these proposals are probably the minimum required to meet public concern about these cases. So long as Mr. Clark agrees to absorb the costs within the survey settlement for next year, we can go along with them, but we need to be very careful about repercussions in two directions. Now, just pausing there and before we look at what Mr. Saunders goes on to say, it, it might be said as though this minute reads as, as though it's the Treasury official effectively telling the Chief Secretary what he should or, or, or shouldn't do. You should support Mr. Clark's proposals. Was, was that... Was it's, that normal? It, no, no, no. I mean, it, it's a Treasury official advising the Chief Secretary. The Chief Secretary may or may not take any notice of that. It's a Treasury, uh, it's a Treasury official's duty to advise. He advises, but the Chief Secretary would make up his own mind about whether he actually took that advice. So there's no way you can dilute the responsibility for the outcome to the official. The decision would have been made by the Chief Secretary. And the Chief Secretary is free to challenge or Absolutely. reject the advice provided. Absolutely. I mean, the officials, in exceptional circumstances, may suggest a change of policy, but mostly they will reinforce what the present position is and what the dangers are of moving beyond it. But of course, ministers have to live with the decision that's taken. So the chief secretary would have been entirely able to change it. If he had proposed to do so, I don't know whether he did. But if he, if he had uh, proposed to change it, he would probably have called a meeting with the official and perhaps with uh, other senior officials. The uh, permanent secretary responsible for public expenditure, for example. And they might have discussed it and may well have reached a different decision. Um, and then I just wanted to ask you about um, something that's said in the next um, paragraph. And it's really, again, trying to understand or, or get your assistance about the, the, the way in which decisions were taken rather than this specific decision. So in paragraph 7, um, what's said is, there is in logic no reason to compensate haemophiliacs who contracted HIV from infected blood products, but not other victims of the disease. The department and health authorities were almost certainly not liable in the legal sense. And then it's this, Sir John. And given the state of knowledge at the time, the early 80s, about the causes of and method of transmission of AIDS, there was little reason to suspect that haemophiliacs receiving factor VIII were at risk. Now, certainly the evidence the inquiry has heard, based upon contemporaneous material, might put a different complexion on that. And I'm not asking you to, to express a view on the correctness or otherwise of that statement. But in, in terms of process, this is someone, an official within the Treasury, um, setting out in, in his advice to the Chief Secretary a, a statement, a, an assertion about the state of knowledge about the risks of AIDS in, in the early 1980s. If a Treasury official is going to make that kind of statement or provide that kind of advice, what, would you expect him to have some proper evidential basis for that? And, and, and how would you expect the department to go about uh, exploring whether that statement was correct or not? Well, I don't know what evidence the official who wrote that would have had. But of course, AIDS was becoming a significant problem at the time. Norman Fowler was chairing committees related to it. Those committees would have met. Advice would have been given to those committees. That advice would have been enshrined in the um, in, in the uh, reports of what that committee discussed and decided, and the official may well have been drawing on what was said to the AIDS committee. I don't know, but I suspect that is probably. The official wouldn't have made it up. He w it would either have been a matter that was common knowledge, as it were, or it would more likely have been a matter that was picked up from other government documentation that had been copied to him, but which he not necessarily was part of. Would it be right to say that, that a Treasury official, uh, and this is as a matter of generality, I'm not asking you to comment on what Mr Saunders himself was saying at this point of time, but a Treasury official should not make that kind of statement, would you accept, unless there's a, some form of evidential basis for it? Well, I don't know about should not. I mean, in my experience, they didn't. 
uh, make that sort of statement without some sort of knowledge because it would have been a mistake to do so. So I do not know where that knowledge no. came from and I wasn't involved in it, but I suspect, as I said, that it would have come from some other document within government, probably the minutes of uh, something related to the AIDS committee. And then just to complete, again, the picture in relation to um, this decision-making in November of 1989, um, if we go to HMTR 601 underscore 012. <clears throat> um, so this is uh, 20th of November 1989. It's from number 10, Paul Gray at number 10, uh, to uh, an official within the Department of Health. And we can see it refers in the first paragraph to a, a meeting having taken place involving the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State for Health, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury um, and also the Attorney General to uh, consider this announcement of a further £20 million allocation to the McFarlane Trust. Um, I just want to ask you about two passages within this letter. And again, it's really for your general observation, Sir John, rather than mm -hmm. the, uh, any direct involvement. If we could just go down a little further, please, Lawrence, third paragraph. So um, the letter records this. Summing up this part of the discussion, the Prime Minister said it was agreed that the issue of whether or not to proceed with a further allocation to the McFarlane Trust need not be affected by the position reached in the legal proceedings. The issue therefore fell to be settled on political grounds. Um, knowing as you must have done the Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, fairly well by that point in time, um, do you have any insight into what that reference might be to political grounds? It's clumsily phrased. Uh, that is certainly true. Um, I think what they're seeking to say here, and then the last sentence is uh, clumsy and uh, capable of misrepresentation. What they're saying there is that we need not do things on the basis that we, we were likely to lose in court. We had to reach a political decision on what to do. Now, that political decision would be based on many things. It would be based, as you will undoubtedly put to me, on pressure perhaps in the House of Commons or from the uh, Haemophilia Society. But it would also uh, have been based upon whether it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do in terms of helping people who were in a desperate situation. Now, you could have expressed it in that fashion and enlarged the summing up. But the summing up is inevitably not word perfect. It may not even be an absolutely accurate version in that it was abbreviated of what was actually said by the Prime Minister. I have no idea. But it would certainly have embraced what the political situation was. And that would involve the concern, the moral concern, the need for people to get help, and the political pressure. All of those things would have been a focus which was the dominant focus in the Prime Minister's mind, I have no means of knowing, but it would have involved all those, I'm sure. And, and then just to pick up on the, on the issue of the moral focus, if we can, if we go over the page. Uh, said, um, second paragraph, in discussion, the following points were raised. One, in presenting such a package, it would be desirable, as well as, to avoid, as, well as avoiding any acceptance of legal liability, to avoid conceding any moral mm. obligation, rather the emphasis should be on the special circumstances of this particular case, although distinguishing the position of the haemophiliacs from other difficult cases like vaccine damage was not easy. Um, so uh, there, you, you, you've previously spoken about the, the moral mm. case or the moral obligation. This appears to be Prime Minister, Secretary of State, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, n not obviously you part of that meeting, saying that there shouldn't be a concession of a moral obligation. Um, again, really drawing on your knowledge of the government at that time, can you help us understand why that might be the case? Well, I, yes, I can, uh, almost certainly. If the government had started talking rather than acting on the question of a moral obligation, if they had started talking, it's, it's the old problem of opening the gate to all sorts of other things. That, I'm sure, would have been what is in their mind. You can think, everyone in this room can think of a, d a dozen things where you could argue someone has a moral obligation to do something. And the government has to guard against that if it is to keep control of events 
and keep control of the sum total of its expenditure. So it is the same point that we came up, to, up against earlier. It is, uh, it is trying to ensure that whilst there must be extra help, it's presented purely as an ex gratia payment without indicating the underlying elements that created the need for that ex gratia payment. That, I am sure, would, I do not know, I didn't write it, but that, I am sure, is what would have been in their mind. If we then move now, nearly a year forward, to October 1990, so to the last um, uh, few weeks of, of your uh, time as Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, and uh, as you'll know, um, Sir John, the, the litigation referred to commonly as the HIV haemophilia litigation um, was ongoing, um, and that came to your attention in October of 1990, if we can just work through a handful of documents, no, not all of them um, would have been seen by you. Um, but if we start with HMTR 601 underscore 042. Uh, now, this is um, a minute of the 2nd of October. It's from uh, Mr. Edwards, so 2nd of October 1990 to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, um, if you look at the names there, is this copied to, to your office? It doesn't so, seem to be, no. Um, and then we can see in any event that there's reference to, there's been a discussion with Mr. Clark, um, and the issue that's now come to the fore is whether the <coughs> government should negotiate an out-of-court settlement or let the court case proceed. That's what's set out in paragraph two. Um, uh, and then um, if we look down towards the bottom of the page, we can see some advantages and disadvantages set out of those two courses. So advantage of negotiation would be the government would hope to settle the matter quickly, avoid a long drawn out court case, attracting much opprobrium over an extended period. Top of the next page. Disadvantages of negotiation would be likelihood of a more expensive outcome, high probability that the existence of the negotiation and any offers made would leak and cause the government further embarrassment and opprobrium. See the improbability of settling out of court for a sum as low as 24 to 30 million. Um, and then D, if, as is all too likely, the existence of the negotiation leaked but no deal was struck, the government's condition would be far worse than if no negotiation had been entered at all. A failed negotiation would give the critics a field day, and the trial would proceed on the basis the government was prepared to offer 30 million. And then paragraph six is... Um, the policy of letting the case proceed without any attempt at negotiation. And then we see, again, the advantages and disadvantages set out. Um, a, strong probability the government would win. Uh, B, the likelihood of setting damaging and expensive precedents would be much less. C, the risk of embarrassing leaks from behind the scenes negotiations would be avoided. So those are the advantages. And then top of the next page, disadvantages would be the likelihood of continuing criticisms over an extended period. Um, and B, the slight risk of losing the case badly. Uh, and then paragraph eight, on the above analysis, the strategy of assuming negotiation and letting the court case proceed looks to be clearly preferable, certainly from the Treasury point of view and probably from the point of view of the government as a whole. Now, looking at those pros and cons, and again, I'm really asking for your, your observation as an informed insider rather than someone who was directly participating in the, the decision-making at this point in time, Sir John. But th that discussion of pros and cons, very much looking at government spending, cost to the government, reputation, criticisms of the government. There's no, or it might be said, there's no reflection there of the position of the, the haemophiliacs, um, the advantage of alleviating suffering, uh, etc. Um, is there anything you can assist us in understanding why the Treasury might be presenting it from that point of view or looking at it from that point of view? Well, the Treasury would have been looking at it purely from the point of, if it had come from other departments, if it had come from the Department of Health, you may have seen that. But the Treasury would be uh, speaking to its own responsibilities, and its own responsibilities are to control expenditure within reason. And sometimes it's not possible to control expenditure, and it wasn't here, and it soon became apparent that it wasn't here. But the Treasury would have put forward its argument, and it would have 
no doubt entered into debate with whomsoever they were discussing it with, uh, or whichever committee it may have gone to, and a conclusion would have been reached. But the Treasury wouldn't have put forward a case and then undermined the expenditure case by adding other issues as well. Uh, and that would have been true since the dawn of time with Treasuries, as far as I'm aware. So the Treasury's primary concerns, because it is the Treasury, would be fiscal and political for uh, the government? Say, yes, I think that's a slightly harsh way of putting it, if I may say so. I can see why you do that. But um, I think it might be fairer to put it, the Treasury has to advance the case that the Treasury is there to advance. And the Treasury is there to protect and advance the quantum of public expenditure and the direction of public expenditure. As you will have seen, what has happened in the past, the Treasury appeared to be resistant. But when it went into discussion with the Chief Secretary and the Department of Health, the Treasury wasn't really resistant at all when you got down to discussing the actual impact that it was intended the sums made available were for. If we just follow this through, um, so that was 2nd of, of October, if we just pick it up at HMTR 601 underscore 043, we get to the 5th of October, um, uh, and uh, um, again, it's Mr Edwards to the Chief Secretary. If we just look at paragraph 4, please, so if we go just further down the page, Lance. It says, you may wish to check before writing or talking that the Chancellor, so that was you, Sir John, is of a similar persuasion, hence the square bracketed final paragraph of the draft letter. If we go over the page, this is the draft that had been prepared by Treasury officials for the Chief Secretary to, to send to Kenneth Clark as Secretary of State for Health. And we can just see the, the second paragraph explains um, uh, um, the line to take that the Treasury is suggesting is that any attempt to negotiate an out of course settlement would be a bad mistake. We have to let the haemophiliacs representatives bring the court case if their intent is they appear to be on doing so. And then there's a discussion again of the pro and pros and cons set out in the letter. I'm not going to go through that again. It reflects the document we just looked at. But if we go to the bottom of the next page, we can see there's a very last paragraph on the page there's a bit in square brackets, John Major has authorised me to say that he shares my views on this. Now, um, that I think it was anticipating, um, the, the minute would suggest, that, that the Chief Secretary would discuss with you and, and, and try and ascertain what your views were. I, I don't think the documents tell us if that happened or not. Um, it's probably a stretch to ask you to remember, Sir John, but do you know whether that's a conversation that took place or not? Well, if... Uh if Norman Lamont said that he had discussed it with me, then he would have discussed it with me. Do I remember it at this distance in time? It might have been a very brief discussion at the morning meeting. We have in mind to do this, and I dare say there was more to it than that. Uh, we have it in mind to do this. Are you content? And I would have said, if that's what you think is the right thing to do, Norman, go ahead. But were, was I involved in a structured discussion about this? I don't recall one. And I don't know of anything in the official documentation that suggests that I was. But of course, at this distance in time, who could be absolutely certain? But I don't think so. Now, I just want to briefly bring up two documents just to show where the position had got to by the middle of October. So the first is HMTR 601 underscore 046. This is Mr. Edwards, 15th of October. 19th. Actually, that square bracketed bit at the end may have been, I mean, you've seen a letter with the square brackets in it. That may have been before he discussed it yep. with me, and it's in square brackets because he was intending to do so. That's my reading, Sir John, yes, yes. he may well have done that, so it may be he didn't discuss it with me, but I simply don't know. No, th there is, attached to the document that we're just about to look at, there is a later version of the, of the draft letter which doesn't <coughs> include any reference to you, so I, I don't think it... Um, that, uh, it, it's by no means clear whether there was a discussion with you. Um, uh, so this is 15th of October, uh, and um, it, there's a reference to there going to be debates in Parliament, in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. I just want to pick up paragraph two. Department of Health officials assure me the government line on both occasions will remain exactly as it has been hitherto. 
there will be no suggestion that the government might be willing to negotiate an out-of-court settlement. So this is really just to dis show the chronology of events, Sir mm. John, in the weeks before you became Prime Minister. So that, that's the position set out in this minute. And then if we look at DHSC 0046936 underscore 035, please. We can see this is the 16th of October 1990. Um, and if we go just a little further down the page, please, Lawrence. Right hand column, we have Mr. Wallace um, asks a question Does the Prime Minister agree that the honourable and decent way forward in the tragic case of the 1,200 haemophiliacs suffering from the AIDS virus is to offer far more generous compensation? than has been the case up to now, rather than continuing to fund ever-increasing fees for lawyers to argue the toss over the matter. And then we have the Prime Minister's answer. The government have already made available some £34 million to the haemophiliacs who are suffering from this very grievous happening as an ex-gratia payment without prejudice to their taking legal action in the courts. Obviously, we wish to know the legal position before any further payment is considered. Um, so I don't have a question for you, Sir John. That's to show where things had got to by the middle of October uh, 1990. Um, now, you became Prime Minister 28th of November 1990. But before we look at then how this issue came to your attention um, as Prime Minister, could, can you just help us a little with understanding more the organisation of number 10 and, and how it might be that decisions or documents might come to you as Prime Minister um, and, and what, what might not be, be put before you? Was, was there any particular rule of thumb? Well, it wasn't really a rule of thumb. Uh, I mean, it was a pretty rigid uh, uh, set of circumstances. Uh, things would typically come to the Prime Minister if they were likely to be controversial, if there was something upon which the Prime Minister need to, needed to rule, if there was something that the Prime Minister had previously spoken about, any of those would mean that uh, documentation was copied to the Prime Minister. It might be copied to the Prime Minister for all sorts of other reasons as well. It might be copied to the Prime Minister if the Secretary of State thought, hang on, at some stage this is going to come back and bite the government in some way on any issue. So therefore, we better make sure that Number 10 knows about it now. And so they write a memo and they copy it to, uh, to Number 10. Um, these submissions would come into number 10. They'd come into the private office. They would be filtered by the various secret economic secretary, foreign affairs secretary, and so forth. And then presented almost certainly to the prime minister's principal private secretary, who would decide which of those matters actually had to be seen by the prime minister straight away, and which had to be held because they had been sent in case something would happen in future, so that number 10 had been informed about it and could carry it forward. Now, I don't know what percentage of the things that are referred to, that are copied to number 10, are actually seen by the Prime Minister. But my guess is that it would be a pretty small percentage that were actually seen, simply because of the sheer volume of paper. I don't wish to set out all the other things that take the Prime Minister's time. Um, suffice to say, there is a great deal. And the paperwork is absolutely extraordinary. So the job of the private office would be to protect the Prime Minister from having to read things that were not immediately relevant, very important, or whatever it may be. They, they would be very selective in what they showed him. But they would keep the correspondence to hand in case something else occurred that meant the Prime Minister should go back and read that earlier submission to number 10. Um, now Around a week after you um, became Prime Minister, um, Mr. Waldegrave, who was Secretary of State for Health, wrote to you. Uh, and, and if we can um, just follow through the correspondence over um, the, uh, the, the days that, that uh, then followed. We start with HMTR 602 underscore 016, please, Lawrence. Um, so this is addressed to you. If we go to the, the second page, um, first of all, 
We can see it's dated the 5th of December 1990, and it's WW, so William Waldegrave. Um, if we go back to the preceding page, uh, we can see uh, uh, Mr. Waldegrave said this, further to your exchange with Terence Higgins at yesterday's questions, I'm writing to let you know the current position on the HIV litigation involving haemophiliacs. Um, and then he sets out a number of points in, by way of background. The third paragraph refers to the two payments um, previously made. Fourth paragraph explains, however, around 770 infected haemophiliacs and 190 of their partners and close relatives are suing the government and the health authorities for damages alleging negligence. The main court hearing has been set for March 1991, as it's expected to last for six months. The trial judge took the exceptional step of suggesting that both sides should consider a compromise settlement. In its formal rejection, the department said that the moral and compassionate arguments had already been recognized by the government and drew attention to the dangers of creating an expectation that all those injured as an unintended effect of NHS treatment would receive compensation without having to prove negligence. However, the coordinating committee for the plaintiff solicitors have now put forward a proposal which would in effect involve a total cost to the government of some 50 million pounds. This is very much lower than their earlier proposal of nearly 100 million pounds and may, I am advised, represent the fact that the doves amongst their lawyers are temporarily in the ascendant over the hawks. We therefore have a choice before us, which I'm about to discuss with the Chief Secretary, and about which I will then want to minute you. Legal costs of going on may be £20 million pounds or so. Political costs are high. On the other hand, precedents are dangerous. The purpose of this note is not to ask for a decision, since I've not yet had my meeting with HMT, and the costs and benefits of either course are therefore not yet agreed. But to warn you that the last occasion when a decision other than to fight it out could be taken is going to occur in the next few days. Uh, meanwhile, obviously, we must play um, a, a dead bat. Um, so, uh, um, obviously, I can ask Lord Waldegrave, as, as he now is about that, when he gives evidence uh, next week. Um, but that's... Uh, the minute he sent to you on the 5th of December, not asking for any particular action or decision on your part yet, uh, yet, is it likely, given it's directly from a minister to you, that you would have seen that? I think it's certain I would have seen it. Um, and then on an issue like this, and from the Secretary of State, I'm sure I would have seen it. Um, and then we can then just pick it up on the 7th of December, when... Um, uh, Mr. Waldegrave wrote to you again, HMTR 602 underscore 019. So th this is a covering minute which gives the date of the 7th of December. Um, uh, and we can see from the covering minute it says, as agreed, I enclose a copy of the minute which has gone to the Prime Minister um, this evening. And then if we go over the page, so this is again from William Waldegrave to you. Um, he refers to the earlier minute of the 5th of December. Two, I was able to go through the issues in detail with the Chief Secretary yesterday evening. We examined in particular the proposal put forward by the Plaintiffs' Council. Three, the conclusion was that provided that the plaintiffs would commit themselves to accept their council's proposal, we should be prepared to accept it. On our best estimates, the cost of such a settlement would be higher than the most favourable outcome from fighting and winning the case, but much lower than the cost of fighting and losing the case badly. Our council have put the risks of this as between one in three and one in six. It would also be likely in practice to be cheaper than fighting and losing a significant minority of the cases or fighting initially and settling out of court later. Um, Mr. Waldegrove then records a conversation he'd had with the, the leading counsel uh, for um, uh, the, the government, um, uh, who'd had a conversation with the plaintiff's counsel. Paragraph five says that that counsel reported back that Rupert Jackson, so that's the plaintiff's lead counsel, believes the proposed settlement would stick and will advise the plaintiff's steering committee to accept it. Um, in Rupert Jackson's view, the longer the affair continues, the more difficult it will be for him to get agreement from his clients. If we go to the next page, um, we then see um, the, the reasons Mr. Waldegrave sets out for um, not passing by the opportunity to settle this. So he says this, the Chief Secretary and I believe that we should not pass by a possible opportunity to settle this very difficult issue 
We are coming under increasing pressure to settle, not least from our own backbenchers. So that's the first point, pressure from backbenchers. Settlement now would enable us to avoid the long drawn out court cases beginning next March in which public sympathy would be with the haemophiliacs. So that's, again, the, we've got the backbench view, now the public view being set out. Then the third reason given, it would also strengthen our position in dealing with Rosie Barnes' private member's bill on no-fault compensation. Uh, the amounts payable per person, um, as shown on page one of council's proposal attached, would not be publicly regarded as overly generous, though the plaintiffs have, of course, received £20,000 each or more from the government already. We think it would be better to settle on the figures proposed by the Haemophiliacs Council if his clients support him than to bargain publicly for lower figures, which would carry the risk of sparking a public auction in which the government would receive little credit and could end up by paying more. And then paragraph seven. That said, we should clearly need to handle our response with the utmost care. And then there are a number of points set out. Again, I, I'll ask Mr. Wardgrave about this in more detail in due course. Um, but he says we mustn't go beyond the 47 to 51 million pound figure, which looks generous by international standards. Recipients would have to undertake to drop existing cases for swear bringing any future cases. All the plaintiffs would need to accept the settlement. Um, and then there's a reference to a, a subcategory of medical negligence count cases. And then bottom of the page, plaintiff's counsel would need to advise his clients that the offer provided a reasonable basis for discontinuing the court action. Um, if we go over the page, and paragraph eight refers to social security disregard. Again, I don't need to ask you about that, Sir John. Paragraph nine um, refers to where the money will, will, will come from in terms of settling the negligence cases. And then paragraph 10 sets out Mr. Waldegrave's proposal to you. I would propose without directly accepting the Haemophiliacs Council's proposal to instruct Andrew Collins to ask their counsel to confirm with his clients that they would settle on the basis he has proposed. We must ensure that the settlement figure which has been proposed remains the Haemophiliacs Council's figure and <coughs> does not become the government's offer, still less the government's opening offer. And then paragraph 11 asks for your authority to proceed accordingly. We must expect that news of the negotiation will leak when counsel consults his clients. He would, however, be consulting his clients about a proposal which he himself has made. And I would propose for the time being to make no public comment. Top of the next page. If we're asked point blank when the negotiations are taking place, we would propose to say that the plaintiff's representatives have been in touch with us, but that we had no further comment to, to make. Um, now, what's your <coughs> understanding of, of why this was coming to you for your authority to proceed? Was it something that required prime ministerial approval? Well, I think it was uh, probable that they thought this was an issue of such size that it ought to have prime ministerial approval. And because, of course, it was uh, breaking with all precedent, breaking with all precedent on no-fault compensation, so therefore the department wished to know that the prime minister was content to breach the previous method of doing business and agree to a payment of this size uh, without, um, without any subsequent difficulties coming back. There are a variety of things about it. Very unusual for the judge to su suggest a compromise settlement, but the judge did suggest a, a compromise settlement. And the coordinating counsel for the plaintiff solicitors themselves did exactly the same. Now, there were a vast range of things to consider here. It would have been absurdly foolish, I think, not to have taken the opportunity of settling uh, an issue that had caused a great deal of anguish for the victims, but also was dragging on for so long that one needed a definitive settlement. And it seemed to me that it was entirely right, and if that could be an agreed settlement rather than an imposed settlement, it was far more likely to be acceptable to people Whatever an imposed settlement would have been, there would have been uh, disputes as to its credibility, to its stickability, and to much else uh, besides. So it seemed, I, I had no doubt, William Waldegrave was a very powerful advocate for settling. He wished to settle. He thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and the Chief Secretary agreed. 
that it was the right thing to do. I assume this all came out of the reserve. I can't recall now, but I'm sure it would have done. And I thought it was the right thing to do for the reasons I've just set out and the moral obligation reason I referred to before, which so upsets people because governments don't actually write it in their, in, in their, uh, in, in their minutes. But I did make two stipulations to that. And they were the stipulations that, that had been suggested, and, and it was important to make it clear that this was not imposed on a take-it-and-leave-it basis by a government who said, you're going to lose the court case. If you don't take this, you'll get nothing. That was not remotely the state of mind, nor was it what happened. So I did make the two stipulations, which you're probably going to call I'm going to, to take you today so yes. that we can just look, look, look at exactly what you said. Yep. So um, if we go next to CABO... 0000044 underscore 007. Now, before we look at the handwriting, Sir John, um, this is a, a minute to you um, from uh, <coughs> Dominic Morris within number 10, uh, 7th of December uh, 1990. We can see the first paragraph refers to the Health Secretary's attached minutes, so that's the document we've just looked at. Uh, and then um, we see Mr. Morris setting out uh, what, essentially a summary, mm. the position in relation to, to the cost. If we go further down, um, that's, yes, so if we just pick it up halfway down that long paragraph that's at the top of the screen, um, uh, the basis is that the Haemophiliac Steering Committee would accept it as full and final settlement of their case. That committee represents most, but not all, of the victims. There's no guarantee that some of the plaintiffs represented by the committee and some of those whom it does not represent would not hold out for a higher figure. But the Health Secretary's view is that faced with the prospect of continuing legislation, I think that probably should be litigation, and a settlement which most had accepted, the remainder would settle. And then the three risks in the approach. First is um, there might be pressure for a, a higher figure. The second is the precedent for future cases. Um, and then over the page, um, the third is the treatment of, of social security payments. Um, and then it records both Barry and I think that these are significant risks, but clearly the health secretary, chief secretary, Tony Newton and council think they're outweighed by the advantages of settlement on the basis proposed. And then you're given two options, content to accept the health secretary's proposals or do you want a meeting early next week to discuss it further? Th that handwriting, is that yours? The it yes. is. So you were content to accept the Health Services Secretary's proposals and you I didn't was. want further a further meeting. If we go back to the first page then, if you can help us with the handwriting. That's mine. Um, yes, <coughs> we can zoom in. top right-hand corner, yes, that's yes, mine. Yes, it, if you could help us um, read exactly what it says. <laughs> um, I know my handwriting I know what A and B say because it's, it's then typed up in a minute from your office, but it's the first bit. Yes. Yes, I could easily live with this. But? But A, it must be clear it's the plaintiff counsel's proposals and his figures, and B, he must get agreement to accept before we announce figures. Um, blah, 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 blah. I can, I can take you to uh, the typewritten copy which tells us what the rest of that says. So Thank you very much. HMTR. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. <laughs> six zeros two underscore zero two zero. Um, so 10th of December, um, this is Dominic Morrison, number 10, um, writing to the Department of Health. Um, so this is recording your, uh, your decision that you've written on, on, on the memo we just looked at. Uh, the Prime Minister was grateful for your Secretary of State's further minute of 7th of December. He agrees that it is right to settle this as soon as possible for many reasons. He agrees that the Health Secretary should proceed as he proposes, but, and then we have the stipulations uh, as you've described them, it must be clear that it is Plaintiff's Council's proposals and his figures. Plaintiff's Council must get agreement from his clients to accept before the government could announce figures. Until then, it is very much plaintiff's counsel's initiative. So those, I think, were the missing words um, on, on, on the um, copy that we had. Now, w w why was it um, important in your mind to be clear that it was the plaintiff's counsel's proposals and figures? Because I didn't want people to think it was an arbitrary proposal enforced upon them by the government. I wanted it to be understood that it was an agreed proposal 
and indeed that the agreement had actually emanated from those representing uh, the victims of the haemophilia disaster. Um, and then the second stipulation, must get agreement from his clients to accept before the government could announce figures. Until then, it's very much plaintiff's counsel's initiative. What, what, what was your thinking there? Well, if his, uh, uh, if, 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 if his clients, um, to borrow your phrase, had said no, then he would no doubt have wished to put an alternative to us. Uh, so I thought it was in everyone's interest to make sure that it was an agreed settlement so that nobody could be aggrieved later as a result of the settlement that was actually made. Um, I much prefer agreement to dispute. And here we had the chance of agreement, and it seemed prudent to make sure that those who were affected by the uh, agreement actually accepted it from their own representatives as being fair, rather than being seen to grudgingly accept it at the hands of the government. Um, so, at this point in time, um, um, were you anticipating that the matter would be considered by the plaintiffs themselves, who, who I think, as far as we know, were unaware of the proposal that had been put forward uh, and, and which the government was, was, was minded to agree to, um, that, that, that they should be informed and agreement should be sought before there was a, an announcement by government? Yes, that was my intention. And when you said there before the government could announce figures. Do you, do you know what you had in mind there? Was that the overall settlement figure or? I was thinking both of the overall settlement figure <clears throat> and that the plaintiff's representative would tell them how it would affect them in the individual categories. Um, so but that was a matter for him, not for us. Um, now, if I can just then pick up what, what happened in terms of the announcements, because there's some um, some um, questions about that. Uh, HMTR 602 underscore 021, please. Um, so this is from uh, Jeremy Hayward, uh, and we can see it's the, from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury's uh, 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 Department, 11th of December, 1990. I think with respect, it was to the Chancellor. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so Mr. Hayward was Private Secretary to the Chancellor at that point. Uh, you're right. It's addressed to the Chancellor. Yes. Sorry, I was just describing who it was from. It's, it's from, from the Mr. Chief Hayward. Secretary to the Chancellor. Yes. Um, uh, and then um, we can see Mr. Hayward sets out this. As I told you... Mr. Waldegrave wants to announce this afternoon that the government has agreed in principle to accept the proposals put forward by the plaintiff's counsel for an out-of-court settlement. Mr. Waldegrave's office have supplied their proposed text to us, copied to you. Crucially, Mr. Waldegrave apparently wishes to make this announcement whether or not the steering committee of lawyers representing the haemophiliacs has signalled its agreement to counsel's proposals. The steering committee is meeting counsel at 1.30 p.m. today. This is, of course, completely at odds with what the Chief Secretary agreed with Mr. Waldegrave last week and inconsistent, too, with the Prime Minister's view, Dominic Morris's minute of yesterday, and that's the document we just looked at. Having discussed this with the Chief Secretary, I've suggested to Number 10 and to the Department of Health an alternative form of words against the contingency that the Steering Committee does not agree to the Plaintiff's Council's proposal this afternoon. And then we can see the alternative for form of words is... Um, uh, could be said much rather more non-committal. I understand Council for the Haemophiliacs has been discussing with his clients a possible settlement. I welcome that. The government will, of course, look at any proposals the plaintiffs may wish to put to us. I cannot comment further at this stage. If we go over the page, it records, number 10 thought this was exactly right. The Department of Health did not. Mr. Waldegrave phoned the Chief Secretary on the car phone to make clear his view that a public announcement that the government was prepared to deal would in fact help to secure the steering committee's agreement. The Chief Secretary expressed the contrary view and stressed that it was not in Mr. Waldegrave's own interest to do anything that would increase the risk of the government being driven to accept a more generous settlement. The Treasury had already been more than generous. The Chief Secretary believes that we should now leave this to the Prime Minister's political judgment. I am fairly confident that Dominic Morris will suggest that the form of words above is more appropriate, unless, of course, the steering committee does agree today with Council's proposed settlement. Um, now, 
again, I can ask Mr. Waldegrave about his own thinking, but if we just go back to the first page, the handwriting at the top of the page, it's, it, it's, it's not your writing, this isn't a document you were seeing, but it says, the PM has now gone along with the Waldegrave proposal and has announced that we are settling. Um, we'll look in a moment at what you said and then what orally and then what Mr. Waldegrave said in, in, in writing, but can you assist us in understanding why there was what might be said to be a, a change of position about how the government would deal publicly with this issue? Well, I'm not sure how much of that would really have come to me in detail. I had obviously said that I agreed with William Waldegrave. How much of the undergrowth had actually come to me and how much of it was a dispute between the two departments, I really don't know at this distance in time. But I think my recollection is that the Plaintiffs' Council did agree. And so we went ahead. I made a generalist statement in answer to a question in the House. And William made a detail, William Waldegrave made a detailed statement in the House, I think possibly either that day or the following day, I forget which. Well, if we just look at those two statements um, uh, to complete the factual picture. So the first, your own statement is at DHSC 0003654-003. Um, so this is the 11th of December. It's um, Prime Minister's question time, it would appear. Um, and uh, there's a question from John Marshall. We'll, we'll see Mr. Marshall's role when we, we look at the uh, issues of... Uh, hepatitis C in particular, but your answer is, um, I can now tell the House that the government have been examining this matter and have been able to agree in principle to proposals being put forward by the plaintiff's lawyers, provided that the proposals are formally approved by individual plaintiffs and in the case of minors by the courts, they should provide a basis for bringing the matter to an agreement successfully and soon. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, will inform the House of the details, I'm sure, on members of all parties will welcome this development as I do. Um, if we just look then at, at uh, Mr. Waldegrove's written answer, DHSC 0020866 underscore 034, please. And... Uh, I think we need to go over the page. Yes, we go over the page. Top of the next page. Mr. Waldegrave says this. This is the 11th of December. So this is a written answer. The steering committee of solicitors representing the HIV haemophiliac plaintiffs and their counsel have put forward to the Department of Health proposals for the settlement of this litigation, which they regard as a fair and reasonable resolution of the plaintiff's claims. Uh, government have carefully considered these proposals, agree they'll provide a fair and proper way of ending this litigation and of making financial provision for all affected haemophiliacs and their dependents. Uh, and then there's a reference to a belief that the case is legally strong, etc. Um, the government have therefore agreed in principle to meet the steering committee's proposals. And then we see the figures being, uh, as in uh, overall figures being given. In outline, the compromise would result in the government providing to the McFarlane Trust, in addition to the £34 million already paid, a further sum of about £42 million for distribution to all HIV haemophiliacs and their families according to their respective circumstances. Furthermore, the government have agreed the payments from the McFarland Trust will not affect entitlement to social security and other statutory benefits. The plaintiff's reasonable legal costs would also be paid by the government. Because the proposed settlement will require the formal approval of all individual plaintiffs, and in the case of minors of the court, it would be inappropriate at this time to publish further details until all plaintiffs in the court have had an opportunity to consider the full terms of the settlement and to approve them. Um, now, it, it might be said that what's been done here by Mr. Waldegrave announcing the overall figure is, is at odds with your stipulation that we looked at, a, your second stipulation uh, 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 that we looked at a few minutes ago. Is that how you understand the position? And, and if so, are you able to under explain to us how that came about? I don't know how it came about at this distance in time. Uh, I, suspect, I suspect the uh, concern was that the agreement would leak because the, agree the agreement was, uh, 
reached between, was known to a number of people. It was known to the Treasury, who I don't think would have leaked. It was known to the Health Department, who probably wouldn't. But it was also known to an awful lot of people at the Haemophilia Society and elsewhere, and people who had been approached. So there was a, heavy, there was a real chance that it, was leak, it would have leaked. And I suspect that this distance in time, it was the danger of a leak that would probably have persuaded ministers, and I assume I was asked about it, uh, that we should proceed straight away before it leaked and began to become very messy. And d did the tabling by Mr. Waldegrave of the written ministerial statement bounce you into making an announcement against your no, better no, no, judgment? No, no, no. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure it wouldn't have done. I mean, at the, at the end, we worked closely on these things, and, and no, he, he wouldn't have done that. Um, leaving aside the question of whether what was done was um, a, a change from what you contemplated in your stipulations or not, why was it thought appropriate to make any announcement in Parliament before the plaintiffs, leave aside the steering committee of lawyers, but the plaintiffs themselves had been consulted, let alone well, given an opportunity to I think the answer was the one I gave you a moment ago. I assume the answer, at this distance in time, unless there was something that I can't remember, I don't know. But I'm assuming, looking at it, that the reason would be that we had been concerned, we would have been concerned about a leak. <clears throat> and it may well have been a partial leak. It may well have been an inaccurate leak. Uh, the danger that is created time and again by leaks that are only partial or are inaccurate of what is proposed by the government it's a constant concern. So I suspect, this distance in time I don't know, but I suspect that would have been a material factor. Uh, and then just one final document on, on, on this issue of, of, of how the announcement was made. HMTR 602 underscore 023. Um, this is a minute from Strawn Heppel in the Department of Health to Mr. Edwards in the Treasury. Um, it's 12th of December, 1990. If we just look at the text before we look at the handwriting, uh, it says, I attach a copy of the press release which the Plaintiff Steering Committee put out yesterday afternoon. Um, you'll see from this that while the Steering Committee comment that the figures do not represent proper compensation in moral terms, they do make it plain that these are figures that they would be prepared to recommend to their clients. Um, uh, I don't think I need to read the rest of, of it. If we can just go and look at the handwriting, I don't think, if we just look at those who were copied first of all, I, is there anyone here um, um, who represents number 10, as far as you can recall? He, um, Alex Allen probably does, or he may have been at the Treasury then. He may have been at the Treasury still, but he did go to uh, number 10. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that this document with these annotations was seen by, by you. In any event, we have in what I think is the handwriting of Mr. Edwards of H um, Treasury, these words, vexing as DH's handling of this was, it turned out as well as or better than we might have expected. X1 is encouraging. That's just a reference to um, an annotation later in the letter. We didn't need to worry about that. I will, however, make clear again to DH that this was no way to do business. Uh, in the meantime, I've asked them to ensure that their press office gets across the point that the government has already provided £34 million. Um, do you have any insight into what, what's being referred to there as the department's vexing handling or of this being no way to do business? Well, almost certainly the change of the announcement procedure, I would think. It just occurs to me, looking at those dates, 12th of December, 1990, that would have been right in the run-up. I'd only been Prime Minister for 14 days. I don't know. It's quite possible I was in America um, meeting President Bush and discussing when the uh, Gulf War would start. Now, I haven't been able to check my diary, but certainly my diary was overwhelmed with pre-Gulf War preparation, as you, as you might uh, imagine. Um, visiting the Gulf to talk about a whole series of things, including the funding of the war, looking at the stationing of the soldiers, the enormous problems we had. We were very concerned in the month leading up to the Gulf War and at the beginning of it 
that the uh, Iraqis Republican Guard had biological and chemical weapons. And we were very, very concerned that they would use those chemical weapons in the Gulf War, which started at the beginning of the 12th of January. Uh, so if there were things I didn't see, that may well have been the reason. I could have been overseas either in, uh, either in the Middle East or in America, or I just could have been so buried under the legislation that things, things were discussed between the Treasury and the Department of Health without necessarily involving me. I've only just noticed the dates. In yes, retrospect, I think that might have been it. We, we know you were in Parliament on the 11th of December, because that's your announcement, but, your hmm. announcement, but in, in terms of the 12th of December... Um, I, 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 I just don't know, but I, I would have known. I, what would have been consuming my mind at that time would have been the onset of war, because we feared very many... Uh, uh, casualties and the Department of Health was very much involved at the time in what to do to prepare in case our servicemen were met with a chemical or biological threat when the fighting actually started. Uh, and then b b before we rise for lunch and just to, to, to complete the, the, the documentation in relation to um, the, the settlement of the litigation, mm -hmm. um, shortly before you became Prime Minister. M Mrs Thatcher wrote a, a letter to uh, Alf Morris, 2nd of November 1990, HSOC 0012332. Um, uh, uh, so it's, it's in response to a letter from uh, Mr Morris, um, enclosing a, a letter from uh, the General Secretary of the Haemophilia Society. Um, if we just skate down the page, first of all, we can see the second paragraph. She says she, that she is appalled by the tragedy, as moved as everyone else by the plight of those infected. Uh, next paragraph says, never disputed our moral responsibility to pay attention to the needs of the victims and their families. Uh, and then the last um, paragraph on that page says, despite our promise to keep under review the 34 million already made available, Many haemophiliacs have decided to pursue legal proceedings, alleging negligence against government licensing authorities, etc. The case is before the courts. Over the page, um, Mrs. Thatcher sets out um, the, the successive government policy in relation to no fault compensation. Mm -hmm. I don't propose to read out that long passage. And then in the last sentence, the last paragraph, she says, I'm sorry if this is a disappointing reply but the government is showing its great concern for haemophiliacs with HIV by the ex gratia payments it's making. The question of compensation has to remain a matter for the courts to decide. Um, so that, that's Mrs Thatcher's position n not long before you take over as Prime Minister. And as we've seen, one of your first steps as Prime Minister was to um, agree to what Mr Waldegrave was putting forward to you as a, as a compromise of the HIV litigation. To what extent was the change in government and, and Mrs Thatcher being replaced by you a factor in the settlement of the case? It's difficult to say. Um, I cannot answer for Mrs Thatcher's views, nor would I seek to do so. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we never discussed them. One meeting that we were going to have, as we discussed earlier, was replaced with a meeting with the Chief Secretary because it involved expenditure. But I suspect that if Mrs Thatcher, despite this letter, if Mrs Thatcher had been presented with uh, uh, an acceptable, agreed solution, I suspect that she would have taken it. I can't be certain of that, but I suspect she would. Certainly to me, I was in no doubt that an agreed settlement was the best option because even if it had been, uh, even if the government had gone to court and won the case, it would not, in my mind, have ended the uh, legitimate claim for help from the haemophiliacs who'd been damaged by infected blood. So we needed a settlement. However the settlement came about, we needed one. And an agreed settlement between those acting for, for haemophiliac victims and the government was self-evidently the best way to proceed.
And, and then can I just finally uh, ask you about one comment you make in your autobiography on this issue. So if we go back to RLIT 0001628, please. We go to page seven of the uh, document. Bottom of the page. You say this. Another priority, so this is the last paragraph, so John, less specific perhaps was tolerance, a conservative value which some Tories overlooked and which I aim to restore to the fold. Two swift acts set the course. I decided to unfreeze child benefit payments. This was achieved at my request in Norman Lamont's first budget. And to compensate haemophiliacs who'd been infected with the HIV virus as a result of contaminated blood transfusions. Both of these decisions achieved a certain notoriety and were seen by some as signs that I was breaking with what had gone before. This was a characteristically false history. The broad tradition of our party was tolerant. Um, and then you say this, if a certain shrill and censorious tone had set in, it was that tone which broke faith with our past. My predecessor was not personally unsympathetic, but some less tolerant than she saw Thatcherism as a vehicle for intolerance and sometimes prejudice. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you about what you say as the the role of tolerance within the Conservative Party, Sir John. Um, it's the reference to, in the context of discussing this very issue in your autobiography, the compensation for haemophiliacs infected with HIV, to a shrill and censorious tone um, uh, and some who saw Thatcherism as a vehicle for intolerance and sometimes prejudice. Who or what did you have in mind there? <laughs> the... Um Every political party is a coalition. It doesn't matter, any political party or any size is a coalition. And that is true of the Conservative Party as well. And there are some people in the Conservative Party who take what you might kindly call a very hawkish view of social issues, the everyone must stand on their own two feet argument, rather than an argument that understands that there is a responsibility for those who can to help those who cannot. And I was referring to the minority who took the stand on your own two feet argument to extremes. Self-evidently in our society, there are a lot of people at any time, not least now, who need help from those who are in a position to give it. And the mainstream of the party I joined was always in favor of doing that. I was very much in favor of doing that. It wasn't a universal view with inside the Conservative Party then as now, and it was to that that I was referring. And the shrill and censorious tone... Came from that group. And not from Mrs Thatcher? I didn't particularly have Mrs Thatcher in mind when I said that, because, as I said, I think if she had been presented with an agreed settlement, I cannot be certain, but I think she would probably have been advised to accept it and would have accepted the advice. People who don't know Mrs Thatcher assume the legend of Mrs. Thatcher is the real Mrs. Thatcher. But underneath the, the legend of the uh, un, uh, uh, unyielding Iron Lady was someone who often did yield and often did a look at things on a human basis to a much greater extent than she has given credit for. May not universally have been true, but in my experience it often was. And I saw her, of course, as... Uh, a social security minister, when she gave me my first job in government, she put me in social security and said, that is where I started. Learn social security and you'll understand something most people in parliament never will. And then in my later jobs as chief secretary, I had a lot of contact with her and self-evidently as chancellor. So I perhaps saw more of her than most. And I saw her in the private unguarded moments as well as in the official, the official uh, uh, prime ministerial role where a policy had been made and she stuck to it rigidly. But it is, it is simply some of the myths about Mrs. Thatcher and uh, her, her hard prejudices are simply not true. They are not the Mrs. Thatcher that I knew. She did have some very hawkish views, but they were not universal and they were not views against hardship in the community in the way it is often presented. But in any event, as I understand your earlier evidence, on this particular issue, compensation for haemophiliacs, you didn't 
have any particular discussions with Mrs Thatcher? No, I had no discussions with them at all, as far as I recall. So I know the time, and I'm going to no move... No formal discussions, certainly. Thank you. Um, I I'm going to move to a different topic after lunch. Right, well, we'll, we'll take a, a, a break now for, for lunch uh, and uh, come back at five past two. Five past two.